Hello, I'm Kristen Johnson. I am a resident family medicine physician at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. I am so excited to be here talking with you all today. Um, if you didn't hear, I'm not sure if this was live yet. Uh, my name is Kristen Johnson. I am a resident family medicine physician here at The Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. Um, I have a passion for taking care of the underserved as well as making the world just a healthier place. And so today we're gonna talk a little bit about health disparities and how they are being impacted by COVID-19. When we talk about health disparities, um, we specifically have to talk about um, Healthy People 2020. Currently we're creating something called Healthy People 2030, um, but it is a roadmap to health um, and dispelling health disparities um, in our country. So when we talk about health disparities, um, health disparities are differences in health outcomes between populations. The CDC specifically talks about differences in health outcomes between populations um, as being preventable because uh, many of these rely on the social determinants of health. So when we talk about the social determinants of health, we have to talk a little bit about what that means. The social determinants of health are um, different things that are non-medical that impact people's ability to stay healthy. Studies have shown that zip codes actually predict one's health better than their genetics. So when we talk about COVID-19 and we talk about a lot of the things that we're hearing in the news, um, the disparities in races by people of color, especially black and brown people who are dying at a higher rate of COVID-19, this is not an inherent genetic thing. This comes from some of those social determinants of health that negatively impact the lives of many who live in our country. The social determinants of health are many. They can either be social, economic, or environmental differences. Some of these differences when we talk about social differences are things many of us hear of. Um, implicit bias, systemic racism, prejudice, but these things don't just happen by race. This also happens many times um, in gender. For example, studies have shown that uh, oftentimes women will be given less pain medication or less opportunities um, to discuss what, why they're in pain by certain physicians. Very similarly, um, some of our patients who have different sexual orientations um, or different gender identities may not feel comfortable going to doctors that they're not sure as to whether or not these doctors are able to take care of them because they don't know if these doctors understand some of the concerns that they have specific to their situation. This also uh, translates to our um, patients uh, of different abilities. Um, some patients who have certain disabilities or um, certain uh, diseases can be seen under a certain stigma. And so those things can impact health. Uh, when we talk about economic differences, these are a lot of the things that we're hearing about in the news today. The availability of food and housing for patients. Do people have what they need in order to be able to shelter in place? Do they have transportation to see their doctors? Do they have insurance coverage to be able to pay for care? Um, also, their career and educational options. When we talk about sheltering at place and we talk about our essential workers, there are many, many of us who are on the front lines who are physicians and nurses, respiratory therapists, healthcare workers. But we also have people who are on the front lines who work in grocery stores, who work in factories. Are these people who are our mail carriers, our UPS drivers, are going, going to be given the same uh, opportunities to be well taken care of and be able to feed their families if they were to stop working? The third thing is the environmental piece of social determinants of health. And I think our, our greatest recent um, example of this would be in Flint, Michigan with water. This goes to access to care, but also clean water, clean air, um, sidewalks in safe neighborhoods. Uh, some of these things um, we've seen even in Ohio um, where uh, children walking to, to the bus stop can um, unfortunately be hit because there are no sidewalks and how do we take care of these things in certain neighborhoods? So as we talk about all these things and it seems like there are so many overarching problems that um, health disparities present to us and making sure that everyone is able to live a very healthy life, 
Uh, our next step is looking at how this affects COVID-19, um, how this affects our patients with COVID-19 and our patients um, preventing, trying to prevent getting COVID-19. The first thing I wanna cover is prevention. So I've mentioned a couple of examples about sheltering in place. Um, one of the things is our homeless population um, and the provisions that are being set for our homeless population, but also the ability to wash your hands or the ability to have hand sanitizer is important. Um, these things can be very difficult for our patients who don't have um, the ability to do that on a, on a regular basis based on where they may live or, or their job. Also their jobs in staying close to each other. Um, some areas in some factories may struggle with being able to separate their uh, people six feet apart. And so in that we have to, you know, keep in mind that there are some patients who may struggle with that. When we talk about risk, we talk about those pre-existing conditions, much of which we've heard people with chronic um, lung disease. But we know that if you're not in an area that has clean air, you're more likely to have chronic lung disease. Or even if you're in an area where you uh, your career puts you in uh, a situation, uh, some of our um, welders, some of our construction workers, and even some of our coal miners um, down in our Appalachian areas may have some trouble uh, with their lungs because of um, environmental things and where they work. Um, so the risk can be environmental. But when we talk about the increases in amounts of risk, especially um, in our black and brown populations, much of this is coming from, once again, those social determinants of health. So this is not a genetic predisposition for a whole group, a whole race of people. This is more so a um, issue with the social determinants of health that many of these people are living under. And then when we talk about treatment, once again, that access to care and availability to care is so important, but we do struggle in some of our areas, our rural areas, where they may only have one doctor for a very, very large amount of people or struggling to get to a hospital in time. Um, as far as fear of seeking care, as I mentioned, in some of our populations uh, with um, gender identity or sexual orientation, um, there can be some concerns with the availability of doctors who not only understand them, but who can take care of them without bias. So in saying all of that, I encourage all of us to continue to think about these health disparities, continue to be nice to each other and shelter at home safe. At this point in time, um, I am currently looking to see if we have any questions. Uh, it looks like um, we have one question about um, difficulty articulating pain. Um, and that also, um, the differences in ability, as I mentioned, that difference in being able to communicate can be um, a struggle in making sure that your um, health is um, advocated for. And so I think that's an important thing to bring up as well. Hello to Mia from Lewis Center. Yes, stay safe to you as well. I'm not seeing a lot of questions up here. So um, I guess to end our um, live video session, um, I think the important thing is for all of us to continue to advocate for our health, um, continue to stay home, shelter in place and stay safe. Go Bucks.